Let's stand to honour the word of God and our pastor as he comes to bring it. Just stay standing a moment. Let's just pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege of being able to meet together today. And Lord, as we open your word, may you open our hearts. May you encourage and inspire us to live lives that would resemble and reflect you. May we experience you today as we lean in expectant to be able to hear from you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Grab a seat. Wow. So um, it's amazing how things come together, right? When, when our kids came to us and said they'd really love the opportunity to be able to share, um, when Liam and Keely said they'd love the opportunity to be able to dedicate their kid, and when we're in the series at the moment of family formation, we didn't realize that all these um, points would converge, but, but here we go. And uh, I just wanted to thank Levi and Abby uh, for preparing those messages this morning. That really, really blessed my heart, I'm sure. That others here this morning would uh, would agree with that. So thank you, Connect Church. It's funny when you say church family, right? Church family. It's something that we say often, but it's kind of like really saying ATM machine. Anyone else get annoyed when someone says ATM machine? The M in machine is literally machine. It's like Automatic teller machine, machine. So church family is like saying family, family, because this is what God designed. The whole importance and the whole way and structure that God designed us to operate in life was as family. He gave us structure as a man and wife and children on how we're to operate. He gave us structure as to how we can come together and operate. And our structure, for someone like myself, can seem a little stifling at times, but what I've experienced is that good structure doesn't prevent fun. It makes it possible without harm. And this is God's intention with family. And I'd like to start this morning in Scripture in the book of Titus. If you've got your Bibles, please turn to Titus. It's really close to the back of the Bible. Uh, This is a letter from the Apostle Paul to one of the leaders of a church And we're going to reflect on some of these lessons this morning as to how we can set up and direct our lives. So Titus chapter 1, verse 4. So Paul's directing this, who? To Titus. But this is something that we can also hear as people who are in church, as people whose hearts are aligned to the call of God for people who are in family, in church. To Titus. A true son in our common faith. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. This is the reason I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking, to appoint elders in every city as I've commanded you. And these are the types of people that I want you to identify and to have established places of authority. I want them to be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children who are not accused of dissipation or insubordination. Children who are not rebellious, who are respectful of authority, their parents, their teachers, those that serve in the community, politicians, police, even if they may not earn that respect necessarily. And there's a few common things in here that we can see that that Paul is illustrating that the way that God has set up church to be is very much like a family. He talks to Titus as a son, a son of God the Father. And that's what when we're called into salvation, first of all, we're not called in to do stuff. We're not called, God didn't save us to put us straight to work. We get to work out of the the incredible honor that we have in just going, wow, God, you are amazing. I can't help but want to contribute towards this great work that, that went about saving me. But God calls us when we're saved and redeems us and sets us free, not as slaves or servants, but as sons and daughters. 
it's quite an incredible concept when you consider that the God who created the universe would give everything for us to be in relationship as sons and daughters with Him. God did all that for the purpose of putting us in His family. Then we see in this second part here that the reason why Paul is instructing Titus to put things in place is to set in order. You know, there's an order that God wants. God has an order of things. And, and we experience here on earth very disorderly versions of what God had set in order. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And after day one, God said that it is. On day two, God said it is. On day three, God said it is. On day four, God said it is. On day five, God said it is. On day six, God said it is. It's very good. What God made is good. Amen? Uh, kind of. <laughs> okay, I know we haven't fully seen it or experienced it, but I was hoping today that there might have been some people of faith that understood what God made was good because the Word says it. What God made is good. Amen? There we go. Excellent. But what we experience on earth is definitely something less than good. It is disorderly. God set in order perfection, abundance, great relationship, great health, great life. But on earth, we regularly experience a disorderly version of full and complete health with nothing missing and nothing broken. We experience in our relationships tension and frustration and dysfunction. We, we experience these, these areas that are not the way that God had set it out and intended things to be. And we see here that there is an example of how we live our lives every day in our family, not just one day a week on church attendance, but a man who would seek to lead a church must be blameless. Now, if we, if we just take it at that level, I would have been well disqualified a long, long time ago. What this means is someone who is committed to the work of perfection, of giving themselves to Christ, who comes and is repentant, who is honest, who is vulnerable before God and before their elders, and who makes themselves continually before God clear and clean. Husband of one wife. Faithful children. This is an important thing that we need to be as people that would seek to live lives of Christ in church as leaders is we've got to live it every day with our family. Our home is our first church. And I'm speaking to, to people here today as leaders because someone is always watching. I'm not just talking about Jesus, but someone is always watching us. Someone is always looking at us for an example. And it's important for us to bear that in mind and to remember that. We've got to be able to lead those well who watch us. And when I talk about family, family is singles. Family is a married couple that don't yet have children or whose children have left home. Family is people like in our stage of life where you've got man-childs, 18, and, and teenage childs, and all, all the stuff that Family is, is where you are in your stage of life and the community that you create around you. God calls us to operate in the place that we're, we're called to run well. And the term church it actually comes from the word ecclesia. And ecclesia means a called out assembly. It means a people that are dedicated to live differently to the disorderly experience that we have on earth. It means to, to step away from the drama and the dysfunction. And it means to be established in a different way. And this doesn't happen naturally. Because naturally, we just respond the same as everybody else. When we have a call to Christianity, it's not a call to look down our noses at other people and think that we're better than everyone else. We're just the first people that admit we're really messed up and we need help from God. 
And so we, we come to God and say, this world is experiencing extreme brokenness. My life has been touched by extreme brokenness. And like Levi, you've probably been pushed on the bus maybe once or twice before and you don't feel like forgiving. It takes a supernatural power to be able to enable us to live a life that is not natural. To forgive people when they don't deserve it. To forgive ourselves when we feel we don't deserve it. It takes something out of this world to create an experience this, that this world cannot. Amen? And so we pray, God, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom come. Your will be done in my life. Give me the power to do different to what I see and what I have experienced. Give me the ability to parent differently to my parents, not because they're bad people, but because I want to give myself to you, God, and to raise a standard that they can stand on as, as parents and as, as adults themselves to be able to commit themselves before God and see their children raised in another standard above what we've set for them. We ask God for your supernatural power for us to give, a, to give us an experience that we cannot have here on earth, to be a called out assembly. I, I love what Joshua declares in, in the book of Joshua 24, and he says, as for me and my household... We're going to serve the Lord. That's what it looks like to be a called out assembly. When, when the children of Israel were grumbling and whinging and, and feeling like they couldn't step into the promise that God has, Joshua says, I know the God that we have, but I'm going to go more than just know. I'm going to follow him. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And I wonder, Connect, if there would be a people. I wonder if there would be a passion to be a family that would say, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. It's not something that I can do in my own strength or ability or power. It's not by my might. It's not by my power, but it's by the Spirit of the Lord. And He's given us the ability to live life different. We don't have to live according to this dysfunction and disorder that this world we see happen. Even the things that we've created in our own life that are disorderly. God will heal all of those places. And that's why I started out by saying church family and how funny that is. It's like saying ATM machine. It's one and the same. Over the last few weeks, we've, we've read a couple of times from Genesis about Abraham who started what we have as faith. Abraham chapter 12. God says, Abram, I'm going to call you out of your father's house. I'm going to call you out of a land. But then later in Genesis chapter 26, we see that God makes a promise to Abraham and says, from your seed, all nations of the earth will be blessed. So God into a family called him to create and establish a family that was different. He wanted something cut off and stopped from the experience that was in the ways of the world and said, I want you to establish something by faith that is going to transform this whole world. Today, 6,000, 5,000, whatever years later, we're talking about this old guy that had a kid who it was physically impossible to have happen. I love how it puts it in, in the book of Acts, chapter 3, verse 25, when it's reflecting on Abram. And it says, In your seed, all the families of the earth will be blessed. In the book of Hebrews, we can see that the main thing that Abraham is to be known for is his faith. Through faith, the faith of Abraham that we can adopt, that we can pick up, Abraham didn't even have the scripture to tell him about the Christ, yet he had faith to look forward to the Christ that was to come. And he established something in families that we can lay a hold of through what Jesus has done. We can say, God, I have royally messed it up. I haven't been the man you've called me to be. I haven't been the husband or the father that you've called me to be. I'm not going to stay in the mully grubbers. But I'm going to give myself to you. Would you forgive me? Would you heal me? And would you fill me with your power 
to be the man, the father, the husband that I can be through you. And things change, church, when we start operating in faith in this supernatural call that God has called us to live in. You know, often we hear people talking about breaking family curses. And I think that's great. It's something that we definitely need to do. But I want us to be a church that talks about establishing family blessings. Amen? Like, let, let, let's break the family curses, but get on with it. I don't want us to be, be harboring on about family curses because God is a God of blessing. God is a God of blessing. Thousands of years later, this dude called Abraham, we experienced the blessing that through his seed, all families would be blessed. And church, here's a really cool thing that we can, we can learn. Look at this in, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 5, 9 to 10. It says, don't bow down or serve him. The Lord is a jealous God, and he will visit the iniquity upon the fathers, uh, of the fathers onto the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. That's what you call a generational curse. It can go to third and fourth generation. Watch this. Deuteronomy 7, 9. Know that the Lord is your God. He is God. He's faithful and he keeps covenant and mercy for how long? How long? A thousand, not just years, a thousand generations. Hallelujah. He will keep And he will hold a family curse to three and fourth generation. But what if we would be a people that would set up generational blessing that would go to thousands of generations? Is there any fathers and mothers in the house that want to see a spiritual blessing go to their spiritual children? Amen? I want to see my children, both physical and spiritual, raise up in such a way that they are blessed. The people that have walked with me, like the the Nathans of the house, who have grabbed a hold of me and said, disciple me and teach me. I want to see blessing go through them because God has called me to be a father. And whilst I'll be a, a father to my kids, it's not limited. He's called me to be a father to the nations. He's called us to be a people of influence, to build family as singles, as marrieds, As marrieds with kids, it doesn't limit us. God knows where we are and empowers us how to be as we are. He empowers those that are called to be single to do so without the friends with benefits. He empowers us to live a way that we can only live by the power of God. Not just get caught up in the ways of the world. Lord, I'm believing for a thousand generation blessing to start with me. God, would you bring a thousand, year, a thousand generation blessing into those in this house? Would you, would you burn in our hearts a desire to pursue you in such a way that would release a thousand generation blessing in Jesus' name? For those that love him and keep his commandments. Church, would you love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your mind, with all of your soul and all of your strength? and Love your neighbor as yourself. In this is consumed all of the law and the prophets. We've got to be an example. Let's build blessing. I I think about Moses. He was cast out of his family, not because they didn't want him, but because they couldn't keep him. Put into the, the little floaty baby bed thing. Went down the river. That was a technical term. Floaty thing. I'm pretty sure it's in the Bible. He was abandoned by his first family. Then he went into Egypt and he had to abandon that family. And he ran to Midian. And then he left that family to go back into Egypt. And he ended up with the children of Israel, like a million whinging kids. Because God always calls us back into family. Regardless of whatever family we may come out of or be called out of or need to separate from, God always calls us into family. God always calls us into family. And he wants this to be a place of family. I know from from being under the ministry of of Pastors Mill and Leanne, their heart was always family. They they spoke so much about family. And I'm sure they picked it up from how the church was planted. and, And we've picked that up. This is about family. This is about creating a family because so many people in this world do not experience family or the experience of family is so dysfunctional. 
they struggle to see the goodness of God. And so we live family in this place and we invite others to come and experience family as well. Because before there was church, if you see with, with Moses in his life, before there was any church, there was just family. He was fathering a thousand whinging kids, sorry, a million whinging kids. And God in the commandments gave instruction, and through Deuteronomy, you can, you can read it, gave instruction about how to do life. Don't kill people. It shouldn't have to be a command. Things got pretty dysfunctional. Honor your father and your mother. These are the commands, our instructions about how to live life as family. And then he also gave instruction on how to build a temple and how to do church life. But it was always about how to do family first. Because family should come to church and church should come into family. We should run our family lead our family to God, to open the word together, to be, to be speaking about the goodness of God. I, I love the Shema prayer. It says, um, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then it goes on, it says, and talk about it when you're at your tables and when you're going about your day and, and teach it to your children. Uh, this is discipleship. Our, our children are those that God has called us to have influence over. And why not make it start with our physical children as well? I want to continue in a, in a Titus because it actually gives us the how. God is in the business of blessing families. God is in the business of us following His commandments and His dictates. But maybe you're different to me. I know it can be really hard to not get angry at people that push me on a bus, that cut me off in traffic, that say things that are just so ridiculously inconsiderate and then I've got to try and remain to be a pastor and not respond in the same way because there's an expectation there. But God gives us the grace to do it. Let's check this out, Titus. Here's some instruction in the second chapter of Titus on how we can do this. And it asks the, the, the elder women who are being examples on how to encourage the younger women, the children of the faith to be reverent in behavior, to be honorable, respectful, to not be slanderers and gossips and pulling other people down and those ones on Facebook that always got something to pick about someone else and the, the community groups and the neighborhood groups that are always talking about this stupid cat or something that's going on. Don't be slanderous. Don't be given to too much wine. I think that means whinging as well as the alcoholic beverage because that's if we get caught up in the world's way, it's about consumption. It's like, be free of that stuff. Be teachers of good things. Notice this. He's, he's teaching Titus to teach the elder women, to teach the younger women to be teachers of good things. There's an expectation that the church doesn't rise and fall on a pastor. But the pastor's work is for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. That means that we all are leaders inside and we go out and do the work of God. He's calling us all to be teachers of good things. He's asking that these women would admonish or encourage and implore and teach young women how to love their husbands. For some people, it's harder than others. I'm not looking at Alicia in this point of time because God has graced her with such a supernatural power to love our family well, to love me well, even when I'm not being quite so lovable or lovely. Encourage young women to love their husbands. It's not always easy. Things happen. World gets hard. To love their children. Sometimes that's not so easy. To be discreet. You hear some people like to wear their heart on their sleeve. Some people wear it on their tongue. To be discreet. To be chast, to, to, to dress appropriately, to act appropriately, to speak appropriately, to think appropriately. Homemakers, obedient to their husbands, that the word of God would not be blasphemed. Now, encourage the young men. Be sober-minded. Don't just be immature. God calls us to be childlike in our faith, not in our thoughts. Not in our attitudes. 
I should be able to say bum in church with all the boys, without all the boys going hee hee hee. As the girls as well. It would be sober minded, be, be encouraged. In all things, show yourself to be a pattern of good works. God calls us to be disciplined and to set up a structure of good things so that others can follow and so that we can have fun without hurting ourselves. In doctrine, reading the word, young men, are you reading the word of God? Are you giving yourselves to the Word of God to transform your mind and your heart and your life? Show integrity in the doctrine, in the reading of the Word. Be a person that is, inte- has, is integral, has integrity. If you say you're going to be there, be there. If you say you're going to do it, do it. And do it with everything you have, with reverence and honor and respect that are incorruptible, that you can't be changed based on your friend's group. So often I see young men being swayed by a bunch of buffets because they haven't grounded themselves in the Word of God and have allowed themselves to be corruptible by people around them. Here's a good one. Sound in speech that cannot be condemned. Have you allowed God to transform the language that you use? The things that you speak out about yourself and about other people. The amount of people that are getting blessed on the road these days now. When they cut me off and God's encouraging me to bless them, there are some, there are some really blessed drivers out there. There is a lot of blessed drivers out there. Sound speech that cannot be condemned. That anyone who is an opponent would be ashamed, having nothing evil to say about you. Be an example. And as we do so, we actually empower others to be able to live lives at home. It's not easy to live life well. We all make mistakes. But if we're not willing to be transparent, present ourselves before one another and before the elders to declare the things that we've, we've dropped the ball on and just come clean with it and get clear with it and move on with it, we find all of the, the opposite ends of this come through, the bitterness bad talking about other people and the religious spirits and stuff rise up in us because we're we're just not leaving clear and clean. Here's a great example of how God calls us to live. Be living church in our family and family in our church. You've probably noticed how hard it is to live this way. The way that God calls us to live. Maybe kids, you've, you've found it hard to respect your parents or your teachers to do the right thing, to read the Bible. The enemy is relentless in his attack and pursuit at destroying authority and family. These are two of the most powerful structures that God put in place for us so that we could live godly lives, that we would honor and respect authority and that we would come together in family and build Loving, healthy community. And the enemy is relentless in his pursuit of destroying that. Desperately trying to trick people into thinking fathers aren't important and just lazy fools. That children can disrespect authority. That marriage is not sacred before God. But let me tell you, those fathers are so critically important. Mothers are so critically important. Children should be honorable. It's so, so important. This is how God wants the blessings to flow. In Malachi 2.15, has not the Lord himself ordained, instituted, called for two separate people to become one? And why does the Lord do this? Scripture says, so that there would be godly offspring. It's a picture of the church. It's a picture of marriage and relationship, of people, of separate place, separate thoughts, being able to come together in one unity for godly offspring. That the purpose of the church is unity for the purpose of discipleship, of being able to see people young in their faith come to know the fullness of the riches of God. The purpose of family is for us to come together to be able to bless and raise Godly kids. It's God's 
heart for pure children, childlike in faith, not childish in maturity. So church, can we build a family that serves Christ together for thousand generations of blessing? Can we be a family in our gatherings that we choose to gather regularly, that we choose to invite people to come and experience family? We come and make family what we do, who we are. We create a family service that those who are experiencing brokenness in family will come and be ministered to and made whole. Would have kids that would have father figures, that would be able to be raised in the things of God in spite of the circumstances and situation that they may have experienced. And church, that was part of our intention this year in, in putting kids back into service. The intention was there for us to do family together well. It's not easy. There's some things that we well should have and could have put into place to make that easier for parents to be able to have the kids in service and for us to do that well. But our heart is so that the kids sit in as part of family and love God together, that we come home as family and we talk about it and we work on it. So could you know our heart? Would you continue in that pursuit of having kids that love Christ, that we continually allow them to ask questions, that we continue to bring them to prayer. We continue to, to expose them to environments where the presence of God would be upon their lives. I just want to honor you, Liam and Keely, for what you've done this morning. To continue to stand to raise your family before Christ. I, I know that neither of you guys love, love a platform. And I know what it takes for you to, to present yourselves. And I just want to honor you for that. What you've done is incredible. And what you continue to do is stand for family above all else. May God bless that. May you be such a great example to the rest of us as you serve God through serving your family well. And we, we, just, we were blessed. When we came to Connect Church, we were blessed by Pastors Millen and Leanne. They didn't... <laughs> spend time with us to try and squeeze something out of us. It wasn't about our gifts or talents. None of us knew at that point that we'd be pastoring a church, unless you had some inside information. Surprise to me. We came here because we were broken in ourselves, and we were treated like spiritual kids. They were like spiritual parents to us. I haven't got a dad who goes to church. Still believing on that. It's coming. Watch this space. But Millen became like a spiritual father to me, and they, they nurtured, and they, they corrected, and, and helped, and spoke into us, and, and gave us safe environments that we could continue to pursue our life with Christ. And we found that then they were able to hand the baton on to us. And not, nine years on, we're just, we're just so blessed by the ministry that you guys gave and continue to give. You guys wouldn't know it, but Millen continued to pastor me over the phone after he finished pastoring Connect Church and continued to sow into my life. We've just been so incredibly blessed by the heart of family that is in this place. Not about our gifts, but about our person. Kids, can I encourage you to find ways of serving at home? Serve your parents well. Do the dishes. Sweep the floor without being asked. It is something that God loves and will teach you something about himself. Parents, bless your kids in every opportunity that you can. I love in Psalm 68, 6, it says that God puts the orphans into homes, into families. And my heart is, is that the orphaned in this community would find home in your life, in this place, as you establish yourselves not by 